to the Constitution. And of course, Duncan Hunter is at the forefront of that. They believe, and we covered this article on Friday, they believe they now have 34 state legislatures that have signed on to that, of course. Some of those state legislatures have withdrawn that. The question is, can they withdraw that, so withdraw that support? The problem, though, is not that we don't have a balanced budget amendment. The Constitution really is sufficient. See, the raw, real problem can be addressed if we just aren't on fiat currency, as Ron Paul's pointed out. If we go back to the constitutional money that is backed by gold and silver, we don't have that problem. But if you're going to just print paper money with nothing behind it, you're going to always be able to have a deficit. You know, the reason they put and defined what constitutional money was in the Constitution was because they had just had an experience with paper money. During the Revolutionary War, they printed, the Continental Congress printed paper money, and that's where the expression, not worth the Continental, came from. So in all these areas, if we would just return to the Constitution, if we would get out of office, people who are criminals, people who violate their oaths, that's the problem. And we cannot trust these people to rewrite the Constitution and perhaps make it stronger or perhaps eviscerate it. Who knows what they would do? I think it's a very, very dangerous con uh, problem. The Constitutional Convention, I don't think, is going to solve anything. Having people of integrity and having the guts to get people out of office, that's what's needed. Now, we were talking just before the break about some people who are trying to get into office. Hillary Clinton, of course, and she's added a new qualification to her resume. The fact that she completely lost, either through corruption or through incompetence, $6 billion with a B at the State Department. We also see the Republicans trying to pony up for money in Las Vegas. And uh, this is an article that was linked on the Drudge Report, Vegas or bust for Republicans. It says Las Vegas has a big advantage over the other five cities, hoping to host the Republican National Convention in 2013. And the advantage is Sheldon Adelson. He is adamant that the GOP must go to Vegas, said one source. And some GOPers fear that if Adelson doesn't get his way, He'll just give a couple hundred million dollars to the Democrats just for spite. He'll take his football and he'll go home. Uh, you know, he just had this little four-day bash for uh, some Republicans, the Jewish Republican, the Republican Jewish Coalition Conference. Uh, he had uh, Jeb Bush and Chris Christie and two other governors came there and basically kissed Sheldon Adelson's ring. We'll put it that way. Uh, and uh, so the question, I guess, would be if they're going to have the GOP convention there. Are they going to have a separate uh, Jewish convention like they tried to do with the caucus in 2012? Remember, they had a, a Jewish-only caucus on uh, a Sunday, and they tried to throw out Ron Paul supporters. A lot of really corrupt stuff going on there. And, of course, Shell Nadelson can give $100 million to the Republicans and still come out way ahead. It's still a very good investment for him, a very good return on his investment because they are trying, along with Democrats like Harry Reid, they're trying to stop online gambling, which is his competition. And that has always been the case. Look at this story from The Atlantic, which uh, just came out a couple of days ago. Mega donors are now more important than most politicians. This is an article by Peter Beinert, and he says, uh, quick, name a senator who served between the Civil War and World War I. Oh, can't? Okay. Now name a tycoon who bought senators during that same period. Oh, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, you know, you can come up with a lot more, can't you? He says it's very easy to do that. And he gives an example. William McKinley raised $16 million when he ran, but his opponent, Democrat William Jennings Bryant, only had 600000 So he basically had 32 times the amount of money that his opponent did. And his campaign manager, McKinley's campaign manager, bragged about it. He said, all questions in a democracy are questions of money. Is that the way that it should be? You know, this is an article in The Atlantic, and they're decrying the Supreme Court decisions on uh, Citizens United 1 and 2. But if you're going to shut down people's free speech, that's not the way to do it. Any more than trying to get uh, money out of the system. Just as we see that uh, it's often misquoted, that the love of that money is the root of all evil. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And when we look at politics, it isn't people's free speech that's involved that's the problem. It's the amount of power that is in Washington and the favors that they can deal out. And how they can, unconstitutionally, I believe, 
shut down some businesses and favor others. That's why unless we get serious with the Constitution, unless we get serious about holding people within the limits of the law, unless we get serious about transparency, it's no, there's no way that you're going to be able to sh shut down people's free speech and participation in this. They will just go underground. And the cases that we saw in the Supreme Court cases of Citizens United 1 and 2, these are cases where small organizations were being stepped on. The big guys were already getting what they wanted. The Sheldon Adelsons are already getting what they wanted, and they're going to get what they want. It's just whether or not the smaller people are going to be able to band together and have a say-so to be able to participate, to collectively pool their resources and put out their position. The big guys are going to be able to do that. They're going to go underground. They're going to do that any way they want. And as I mentioned earlier, a good example of this is the laws against craft breweries that are being crafted in Florida. We're also seeing laws against Tesla. They're trying to stop Tesla from selling their cars in New Jersey because they're not using automobile association dealers. So the people who are distributors in Florida are trying to stop the sale of beer in Florida unless it goes to distributors. They're always going to government to try to shut down their competition or to try to give themselves special favors. And that's what you see with Sheldon Adelson. He's trying to shut down his competition. One last thing here on politics, and then I want to go to the police state news that we've got here. Romney's return to public life stokes speculation about a potential run in 2016. I don't think he's going to run again. He's been pretty adamant about it. He's, uh, you know, he's already lost once. It's very unusual for somebody to, uh, uh, to run again after they've lost. It has been done, but it's very unusual. But here's the interesting thing I thought about this article that was on Drudge Report. It says he's appeared on TV news shows 12 times in the past six months, essentially on pace with Michigan's Mike Rogers who led all national politicians last year with 26 appearances. That's interesting because, you know, Mike Rogers, after becoming the poster child for the surveillance state, is now not going to run again in what was considered by many to be a safe Republican district, although it's gone both ways in the last two uh, presidential elections. One of them, it went uh, slightly for the Democrats. Another one, it went slightly for the Republicans. And as bad as it has been with all the revelations about the NSA spying, and his absurd defenses of it, his absurd cheerleading of the NSA's dragnet surveillance programs, I think they're worried that he couldn't get reelected. And so, uh, I don't know, is, is Mitt Romney auditioning for a place on uh, talk radio like uh, Mike Rogers? <laughs> I don't think so. I think Romney already owns uh, Clear Channel, so I don't think he really needs to worry about that. Now, Darren McBrain contacted me about a video that he saw that was put out in 2007. And they were talking about what life was going to be like in 2017. If you remember, the globalists are always talking about 2020 as a time when they're going to get everything put together for this surveillance state, for the police state, for even the beginning of transhumanism. Look at this. Yeah, we're going to have to do this in the next segment. But I want you to see when we play this exactly what they're talking about in 2007. Look at how much of this has come true. Think about the implications of uh, Obamacare and of biometric data. And we're going to talk about the company that does the biometric scanning on this. Basically, what they're saying is that they're going to look at everything that we do, follow everything we do. And, of course, we've seen this happening. People don't understand how important metadata is. Metadata is even more important than your conversations and your emails because they can use that metadata to profile you. And it isn't just the biometrics that they were talking about in 2007. It's many, many different ways that they can grab you. And it's, it's not if you just give them your biometrics. They can get your biometrics now from Facebook. Facebook has exploded since this came out. And most people already have their faces in a database. We're going to be right back with more information and what they were planning in 2007. See if they haven't already got it. We'll be right back. Fifty years, iodine has been phased out of our staple foods and replaced with the halogen bromine, a practice now banned in nations around the world. Guess what else is in the halogen family? 
fluoride. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Jones here. In 1924, the federal government did the right thing and encouraged salt producers to add iodine. It's the good halogen on the periodic table. And the results are on record, reports documented, a 15-point IQ increase in areas that had previously been deficient in iodine. Bottom line, iodine is important. Unbound, clean, in a glycerin base, nascent iodine was the answer for myself and my family. You will find Survival Shield nascent iodine exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com. InfoWars Life Survival Shield nascent iodine isn't just for emergencies. I take it every day. That's InfoWarsLife.com or call toll-free 888-253-3139. Alex Jones here with a message to fellow freedom lovers. The prognosis for the entire planetary economic system runs from bad to worse. The globalist model is to shut down societies and starve patriots out until they acquiesce to the global takeover. That's why we've assembled the most vital and important preparedness items at InfoWarsShop.com. These are items that I did research on, that I personally use. We've got the life straw, so you can turn fetid water into safe water anywhere you go. The KTOR hand crank generator to charge up key equipment during power outages or out in the field. Strategic relocation, third edition by Joel Skousen. When disaster strikes by Matthew Stein. Therosafe, used by Homeland Security to protect yourself during any radiological event. Hand crank shortwave AMFM radios. Everything that we've researched and found to be the best is available at InfoWarsShop.com and your purchase makes our InfoWar possible. We're getting prepared. Are you? InfoWarsShop.com.